Hello. This is episode 30 of This Week with David Rovix, making popular education popular again. Note, the state of emergency I expected to be declared has been declared. If you missed episode 28 of This Week with David Rovix, State of Emergency, you can check it out if you want to at davidrovix.com slash this week. On another note, in about a month from now, I'll be doing gigs in the Midwestern U.S. and in Denmark. Info at davidrovix.com if you might be up for organizing or attending a gig. Okay, now to this week's missive. I recently asked the Twitter sphere for advice on how to get more interest among the Twitterati in my tweets. One of the more intriguing responses came from someone who appeared to be a Trump supporter, advising me to essentially use my communication powers for good and join the right. After overcoming my initial revulsion at the idea, I realized he probably had a point. Simplistic sloganeering and appealing to various sectarian impulses does often seem more straightforward than trying to kindle things like solidarity and a holistic understanding of the complex situation we find ourselves in on planet Earth. One of the tremendous advantages to being a right-winger is it's always easier for people to identify with that which is most familiar, and for a whole lot of different reasons the people physically near you are probably much more familiar than the people who are far away from you. The notion of making the planet great again is a bit vague, and making France or China great again doesn't have immediate appeal here, but making America great again is at least an idea people can get their heads around. We know where America is, anyway. The powers that be in countries like the United States learned long ago that they can rule most profitably when they successfully keep the people divided by concepts such as race and nation, also known as blood and soil. That way, even if the racially divided working class within the country ever, ever manages to unite, they can always divide us again by fomenting nationalism. If we don't hate each other enough, they can get us to hate someone else. So, in terms of communication, what the ruling class despotic types, such as those in power now and for the vast majority of U.S. history, are trying to accomplish is division. They want us divided from each other within the borders of the U.S., and they want us hating certain people outside of the U.S. as well, for good measure. Successfully divided, we'll tend to be more compliant, granted various other factors, such as keeping us totally ignorant of history and even of recent events. A very short memory is key to maintaining a divided population, because these patterns repeat themselves too often not to be recognized if you're actually paying attention. Some of the patterns repeat every four years, in fact. A tried-and-true method for creating division is to make sure the population has developed a sufficiently dehumanized view of the, pop of the people we're supposed to hate. If you've never met an Iranian or a Venezuelan, that helps to keep them all seeming very foreign. If you have no knowledge of the history of U.S. imperialism, or why so many Iranians and Venezuelans despise our government, that's helpful. And then other aspects of the foreignness of our current enemies can be brought to the fore, such as the tendency of most Iranians to practice a religion other than Christianity, or the notion that in Venezuela there are socialists, which we're supposed to understand as something very bad and inherently dysfunctional. The process of dehumanizing or othering a person or population is basically a process of taking what starts out as being familiar and making it unfamiliar. You start out with people who walk, talk, eat, sleep, party, fall in love, get dumped, laugh, cry, work, cook, etc., just like you do, and then your task is to make them seem alien by emphasizing those aspects that are unfamiliar to your audience. While the propagandists for the ruling class and those that they serve fully recognize the importance of dehumanizing those they wish us to think of as our enemies, their policies indicate just how much they realize that our enemies are eminently human and so very familiar. Whether or not those in power all had the prescience to realize that their imperial policies in Central America, the Middle East, and elsewhere would provoke refugee crises, and many of them were fully cognizant that they would, they have universally dealt with the crisis by implementing policies which are designed to target the most basic, most familiar, most human thing of all, our love for our children. It's systematic. You don't even need a pundit to interpret the news for you if you're following global developments at all regularly. 
If you're from the U.S., then you're of course familiar with the child separations at the border, the fact that ICE has detained thousands more children than they originally said they had, that they're being held in terrible situations where they're crying all the time and not allowed to hug each other, and the more recent policy of just not letting refugees even apply for asylum in the first place by creating an intentional bottleneck where they claim they can only process 15 asylum applicants per day at a border crossing. In comparatively humane places like Denmark, appearances are that refugees are welcomed, housed, and otherwise looked after very well. But as the refugee crisis unfolded in 2015, Denmark was one of many countries in Europe that, while continuing to welcome the refugees that got there, was rapidly changing their laws to make their country much less hospitable. The change in the law that refugees learned about most quickly and which had the most devastating impact in terms of where they were trying to seek asylum was when Denmark dramatically lengthened the amount of time someone had to wait after getting refugee status before they can legally get the rest of their family out of the war zone and into safety. So you had the specter of thousands of refugees walking all the way through Denmark refusing aid with the single-minded aim of getting to Sweden not because there's anything better about Sweden for them relative to Denmark, other than the fact that they might not have to wait years before they can be reunited with their children, spouses, etc. In Australia, there has for decades been an effort on the part of both Australian ruling parties to intercept boats full of desperate refugees at sea and then house them indefinitely on one of several small prison islands until they voluntarily decide to go back to the war zones from which they came. In terms of geography, we can be confident that if the U.S. does start a war with Iran, the Iranians fleeing that conflict will join their compatriots among the mosquitoes and destitution on the prison islands of Nauru or Manus. Or they'll attempt to go in the other direction, where if they're lucky, they'll make it to a European country where they might stand a chance of prospering, whether or not they can get their families over any time soon. This is the welcome they will receive from the West. Whether they opposed their governments or not, the corporate imperialists in power who created the crises in the first place, in places like Australia, the UK, and the United States, don't care. They only care that the refugees, like the wars, can then be used to further their capitalist agendas. Once we dehumanize the others, we not only lose any potential ability to organize as a class, the global working class, the workers of the world, often referred to as the people, but we also lose our humanity. We, or at least some significant number of us, then become capable of behaving in the most inhuman ways. We can treat these foreign people much differently than we would ever treat members of the normative population. At a policy level, of course, we can do the most devastating things like bomb other countries, and similarly devastating but less explosive policies like paying dictatorships billions of dollars a year to deal with the refugees for us, building taller walls, ensuring that more people drown in the Mediterranean and die of thirst in the desert. At a more up-close human level, some among law enforcement professionals especially are able to do things it's hard to imagine anyone doing to, say, middle-class white suburbanites separating babies from their mothers as both wail in horror in Texas, calling in armed police to tackle elementary school children for misbehaving in Ohio, strangling a man to death for having a mental breakdown at a welfare office in Norway, dawn police raids on family homes because a father defended his children against racist aggressors in England, and in Belgium, shooting at vehicles you're trying to pull over instead of making them stop by using one of the more usual methods. This incident barely made the news outside of Belgium, but there it was a big deal for a while. I only heard about it because I was in Belgium when it happened. There are many refugees who have specific destinations in mind. You might too if you were a refugee. Going to countries where asylum policies are such that they're likely to be able to bring their families over is one thing. But there are other factors, like people often want to go to countries where they already have extended family members, which in most of the world is just known as family, or where they already speak the local language. So a lot of people who managed to make it to Western Europe still want to go further, to England. 
So every night, there are vans packed full of refugees making their way across the highways of Belgium, driving from the German border to the port of Antwerp, where people are hoping to manage to get on a boat one way or another. And every night, Belgian cops are looking for the vans full of refugees playing cat and mouse. On the night of May 17th, 2018, the driver of one van packed full of refugees refused to pull over when the police signaled for him to do so. The police ultimately fired live ammunition at the van, hitting and killing one of the passengers. She was a German-born Kurdish girl named Mauda Shauri. She was two years old. Their country was invaded and destroyed. Then they had a baby boy. They sold everything they owned so they might escape the war zone. They took the Baltic route north and west. It was the one the smuggler said was best. They got as far as Germany, which is where they had another baby. It's a deadly thing, what some call immigration. England was their final destination. In a crowded van, driving to the port, on past Flanders fields, another life cut short. Cops on every side, the vehicle surrounded. When the loud crack sounded, Mama held her daughter tight in place. Then she saw the bullet hit her face. And Mauda was her name. Mauda. a roadblock for one if you're under fire you can use your gun but all the bullets flew in one direction at first they denied it but at closer inspection the cop was aiming for the driver's head but he missed and hit the girl instead then died on the shores of Turkey or somewhere in the desert or tortured in a prison or on the bottom of the ocean at a Baghdad checkpoint or at a traffic stop or shot down by a Belgian cop Mauda was been episode 30 of This Week with David Rovix. You can find a written version of each episode in blog form at davidrovix.com slash thisweek, which includes a few relevant hyperlinks for further exploration of subjects mentioned. At davidrovix.com slash thisweek, you can also stream or download the podcast, get the RSS feed of both the podcast and the blog, and find out how to support these efforts, which are all crowdfunded. You can also listen to the podcast via the free David Rovix mobile app, or you can search for This Week with David Rovix on any of the usual podcasting platforms, now including Stitcher, as well as Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, YouTube, and iTunes. 
The podcast is also available for radio broadcasters to use each week via the Pacifica audio port. The song Mauda Was Her Name appears on my new LP, Historic Times. You can order a vinyl copy of the album or download the whole thing for free by going to davidrovics.com historic. Okay, signing off for now. Hope to see you next week.